Okay, good morning everyone. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our seminar speaker this morning, Selwyn Sachs. Selwyn did his undergraduate work at the University of Witwatersrand Wh Wh Rand in South Africa on electrical engineering. He stayed at Witwaters Rand to do a PhD in geophysics, and then he stayed a little bit longer at the Bernard Price Institute uh, doing geophysics work. And uh, this was a nice combination of um, uh, degrees to have, electronics, engineering, and uh, geophysics, because then he came to DTM in 1964 and began working with, uh, I guess, the existing uh, DTM seismology, uh, seismology group. And he realized that the uh, seismometers they were using were really in need of some updates and improvements. And so within the first couple of years of being in DTM, he reworked the concept for the broadband seismometer. Then a couple of years later, he and Dale Evertson uh, came up with the concept for a new sort of type of, uh, or the first perhaps borehole strain meter, for which he, uh, uh, Sachs Evertson strain meter, for which he holds several patents. And so he's been involved from the very beginning in not only doing geophysics research, but in developing a unique and novel instrumentation to study new geophysical phenomena. Uh, as part of that, he's, uh, he's been made a fellow of the American Geophysical Union. And he's been a chair and a member of many national committees, including chair of the, uh, the Incorporated Research Institutions and Seismology IRIS Consortium, their instrumentation panel. And uh, he's also was chair of a National Research Council uh, group uh, which was charged with forecasting earthquakes, which is entirely appropriate because that is indeed the topic of today's talk. So, Selwyn, take it away. <laughs> okay. Well, the, this is sort of a depressing title, I realize, why have we failed? <laughs> but the reason for the talk is since there's been intensive studies of earthquakes in Japan and China, which are the two areas I'm going to concentrate on, um, about 300, uh, that in 1970 or so, about 350 people were killed by earthquakes. Uh, and most recently in 2008 in China. The point is that there's obviously something wrong with what we were doing. Now you could say, what's wrong? Either it's too difficult to solve, or we're doing it the wrong way. And I think our conclusion was, we're doing it the wrong way, because we found that people kept doing the same thing they'd been doing for 20 years, even though they'd never worked. So the end result is uh, a fairly depressing one for the community, especially as the politicians are beginning to make bad uh, statements. Now, a couple of points that our approach is rather, let's look at the earth, don't look at a little crack, and especially get out of the lab, and because in all of this time people have been getting a lot of data, studying a lot of earthquakes, there's a lot that we've learned. Okay, first major point I want to make is that the stressed area is much bigger than a fault area. When you think of an earthquake, whatever size it is, that's not the only area which is highly stressed. The highly stressed area is enormous. It's all around it. It's only that particular part which failed. The other part is that none of the faults, the major faults, are new. They've all failed many, many, many times, tens of thousands of times, and the stress concentration on that fault has been set by history. So you have to take that into account. Uh, the other bottom point seem, would be seen to be obvious, but uh, has often been missed, and that is that observations should be dominant in your conclusions. Okay. What, there are certain observations which are sort of holy, they are very strong. Uh, one is the B value. Uh, that is that a large magnitude <coughs> will have one-tenth the number of earthquakes as a one-tenth smaller magnitude and we'll see a lot more of that. It's something that you have, it's a general natural law actually, there are very few big things, a lot of many smaller things. But the model has to give you that. The other is that the fault slip is variable over the fault area. What has happened recently with the advent of larger dynamic range instrumentation is instead of seeing a fault as just one big blob uh, with saturation, you can see there's a lot of structure in it. And that has led us to see that it's 
you have high stress and low stress in the same fault. Uh, these are stress drop proportional to magnitude for magnitude less than 3 and constant for magnitude greater than 3. This is an observation that was made by DTM people a long time ago in Matsushiro, which we didn't take too seriously at the time, but we developed a model to explain that, and that seemed to uh, tell us quite a lot. Then stress drops of earthquakes, that is how much stress did this huge fault relieve, is usually 20 to 80 bar, 20 to 80 bar, no matter where you are. But if you take a rock in the lab, it breaks at a kilobar. So what's why? Anyway, we'll tell you, of course. Uh, this is a study done by Dysart on the Matsushiro broadband. Uh, the point about it is you can see it goes down to very small magnitude. Incidentally, a magnitude 3 you can feel clearly, a magnitude 4 may give you cracks in the house. So these are the small ones. These down here you wouldn't even know happened. We found very clearly, and I won't go through how we determined this, just believe that it was done well, uh, that below about magnitude 3 or 3.5, the fault patch, the size, when you think of an earthquake, you've got two parameters. One is the area which broke, okay, area, just how big a fault cracked. The other is how much slip was there, how much motion was there on that. For instance, you can have a large fault which moves very little, which says you're in California, uh, or you can have a small fault which moves a lot and high stress and they may have the same magnitude. What we found was that below 3 or 3.5, it was one patch moving less and less and less. So the size of the patch that did this one and the size <coughs> that did the other one were the same, but it moved very little in the bottom. However, at the low magnitude. However, when you got above three and a half or something, <coughs> you had multiple patches failing. And that's crucial because that's when you have communication and we're going to see a lot more of that. Okay. So this model, which we call the cellular model, though I didn't, I had another name for it which everybody objected to, including Alan. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, so it gave a B value of about one, varying slip concentration in space and time, stress drop much less than lots of rock strength, and more surprisingly, it forecast great impending earthquakes. We'll see more of, we'll see a lot of data. Now this model was about as simple as you can have. If you're used to disc brakes on your car, you use this kind of model every day. So you have a tectonic force squeezing uh, a fault together, uh, some kind of friction, and there's pore pressure pushing the fault apart. In disc brakes that's zero, but in the earth where you have a lot of water, and the low stress drops in California, earthquake along the San Andreas, have been uh, blamed by people like Jim Rice on the high pore pressure, that there's enough pressure there that keeps the faults apart. And in fact, if you're interested in subduction, uh, you, there are no earthquakes, or very few earthquakes in the top 15 kilometers of subduction because the pore pressure is so high you don't get any earthquakes, it just slides down. And that may be how you can actually start subduction, that's not so the point. Does that mean that uh, in California during the drought you shouldn't get earthquakes? During what? During the drought in California. The drought, unfortunately the drought is a little shallower than what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but nobody bothers about earthquakes there anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, this is our little cellular model. These are different cells, different patches. The definition of a patch is simply that it has the same failure parameters. So if it starts failing here, that whole patch will fail. Uh, that is based on that early observation of Matsushiro. OK, so you get one of these failing, and it may fail a lot or a little. But if this one fails, of course it dumps stress on all its neighbors. You're in a whole space. Those stresses may cause other failure. They may cause the neighbors to fail, in which case you get a larger earthquake, and they may cause more neighbors to fail. So you can see this is how, why that's sort of what I call communication is so important. To have a very large earthquake, you have to have conditions that this fracture will 
continue and that's why you get so few large earthquakes if you want a feeling for B value. Now, let's look at a real earthquake and we back in California, you don't want to be rude about it. Uh, this is Morgan Hill earthquake analyzed by uh, Tim Heaton. As I, the earthquake is 27 kilometers long roughly and it covers about 12 kilometers of the, of the shallow part of the earth. What you can notice here, or should, these numbers tell you what the, the slip is. So when you analyze this as a living thing, as a living earthquake, instead of looking at a dead one, you look at, analyze it as it goes, you find it started here, that was the start, there's some stress here, there's rather low stress there, there's a lot more here, and something less there. So this is actually quite typical. <coughs> that even though you had a patch and you think it goes from here to here, there are high stress areas, there are low stress areas. Now, down below there's a result from our model and it, I think, has very much the same character. The fault starts here quite near an edge and not in a high stress region. And we'll see why later when we watch this earthquake propagate. And then there's a high stress block there. So we thought that pretty much captured what we were talking about. Now, <coughs> doing this, once you're in the computer, of course, you can do anything. So, uh, we look at this. This is a stress buildup. This, is, this could be time, but it's just a computer running. You can see the B value, and it's, it's there, and it fluctuates around. And here we can see B value. Magnitude 7, say 10 times as many 6s, 100 times as many 5s, 1,000 times as many 4s. That is, and in fact, in the early days, when people started getting high sensitivity seismometers, there was an idea that you could tell how dangerous an area was by looking at the magnitude threes or twos, and then saying, well, if there's so many, then you can just extrapolate and say the large ones would happen. That didn't work very well. Uh, so you can't take B value as a, as a religion, but it's, it's something you've got to satisfy. Now, this is this great Tohoku earthquake. This is when we began thinking maybe there was something in what we were doing. Uh, here's Japan. Uh, the, power, the power plant is somewhere here, the one, the Fukushima, which was drowned and actually has brought a stop to nuclear plant development all over the world. The high s stress drop area was here. That's where the start of the tsunami was. The point about this is that this is more than 100 kilometers from shore. So you, have, you don't have much seismic instrumentation there, like almost zero. And you've got to do everything from land, so a lot of the data isn't as good as you would like, but that's what you've got. The B value in this area looks like this. It comes down, and then there's the earthquake. Just before the earthquake, it drops. So we remembered something like that. That's what our model does. This is what the real data does. And it drops to less than 0.5, and this drops to somewhere about less than 0.5 as well. So we thought, wow, here is our very simple model has a character of some of these earthquakes. Well, is this earthquake a freak? What about another one? Here is a great Tanshan earthquake of 1976. This is the most destructive modern earthquake. Mm -hmm. And it's looking at earthquakes like this that make you feel that even if you can't do it, it's worthwhile studying earthquake prediction because 250,000 people were killed in this earthquake even though there was a sort of a prediction of it. But the point here is that there goes B value and drops to somewhere around 0.5 uh, before the earthquake and then the earthquake happens. However, what you will have noticed, of course, is that this low level lasts for years. So it's a warning or a forecast, but you can't actually do anything with it uh, other than get nervous and maybe leave. So what it does, a B value, it does this patchy stress drop, it does all of this stress. So now, whoops, let's have a look at this. Ah. Okay, 
This is an earthquake. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, you'll see that it's irregular. It ends up with a high stress drop hatch here, one there, uh, and it went round and round. And that is actually. Uh, let's see if we can get this to do it again. Yes, we can. see happening is that <coughs> you can see how the earthquake grows it's quite irregular it leaves high stress patches now these high stress patches didn't exist we know what the what the stress was before we started these are if you call these asperities they statistical asperities it just depends how the fault propagated you get it leaves you with higher stress and lower stress and that explains why when you look at repeated earthquakes such as parkfield in california or the sanriku or tokachi oki earthquakes in japan each successive earthquake, which may be 30 years late, has a completely different stress pattern. Now we've got to, whoops, what is going on? Here we are. Luckily this is the last movie, so... Uh, all right. We all know that there are aftershocks. In fact, you heard in the Kumamoto earthquake, which has just been in the news, you have the earthquake which does huge damage and everybody's worried about the next aftershock which would pull down all the buildings which have been damaged. Now intuitively you might think, well, once the earthquake's been there, you've de-stressed everything. But yet there's high, enough high stress left that causes earthquakes. So. What this picture is, is before minus after. Okay. The blue color is reduced stress. So this is the background, the original stress. Blue color is what all the reduced stress, and these are the high stress drop patches we saw. But the red color is stress higher than it was before the earthquake. Now, the outside edge is halo. You can sort of expect this earthquake fell <coughs> here and all around it is left higher stress but it also leaves high stress drop pockets high stress residual pockets in the earthquake and these are the ones which give you the aftershocks so uh, okay we now move on to the next stage so we've got uh, everything up to now has been simple dry rock cracking in a very simple way just the communication gives you the commu that gives you the complication now we come to what happens when you really stress rock and this a lot of work has been done on that going back to brace i think in the 1950s and this is chris schultz did a lot of good work on it what happens when you stress rock its volume increases this may not be intuitively obvious, but uh, here's a very simple comic type explanation. Uh, here's the rock particles which are efficiently packed. If you shear them slightly, they rise up and you get a slight increase in volume. All right. So how much is it? Not very much. Here's the data. Here's percentage of stress, change in volume. 
that's less than half a percent. So <coughs> most of the change we're going to have is around the tenth of a percent level. So it's not much. But in terms of the, the pore space, it's quite a lot. It's a tenth of a percent of the volume, but the pore space is very small, so it's quite a lot, but it makes a huge difference. And we're now going to look at data to see why do we worry about this. Uh, we, we're going to see data which is going to support this and then come back and see how the model, how it actually works. Right. So this is again getting back to DTM studies. This time in Hokkaido, uh, you can see the shoreline there. And this is Takanami's home turf and he's worked on a lot of this. What you have here, these are contours of seismicity, only magnitudes greater than three. What we found is, from our early analysis, that because communication is critical, you should all your studies have to be done at magnitudes more than three or 3.5 or something like that. Because if you look at the smaller ones, you'll see you, you don't get anything, which is why it's not seen if you just look at ordinary seismicity. Okay, here we are from 1976 to 1980, pretty much. <coughs> Lots of earthquakes there, more there, and but between 1980 and 1982, this whole area here goes quiet, and then afterwards it comes back again. So let's look in more detail at that. This is some work that uh, Taylor did. If we look at that outside region, sorry, sorry, yeah, like last slide. Yep. Uh, I mean, Yes, the significant earthquake was uh, here just the next day, and that was a 7.1. 7, 7 Thank you. Yes. Yeah. After, after this time. A few days after that, the earthquake occurred. So, here's what you have. The outside area, small events, don't see anything. They sort of continue pretty much. The larger ones sort of shut off. That's the magnitude dependent quiescence. Inside it's the inside region, you don't see much, but we will see the problem with the inside region is you don't know you've got an inside region until after the earthquake, so it's not very helpful. Here's another part uh, in Japan. Uh, it's on the other side. That part was there. This is here. This is about a magnitude eight and we're looking at magnitudes greater than three. We look a little data, that's, that's two years. Next two years, the seismicity is picking up. Then bingo, before the earthquake, those years, they all shut, it shuts down. Same sort of effect. Now the Kuriles are not Japanese territory, so the seismicity, even though I think they feel some of it should be, uh, but so we don't have the, the spatial coverage. But you can see by magnitude greater than 5, you've got many, and then it shuts off, and over here there was a magnitude 8, 8 point something. So it's the same as this is a very robust effect. Well, let's look at the biggie, the real biggie. This is the magnitude 9, uh, which did all the damage, uh, inside region, outside region. Now here, remember, that's offshore. So we've got as our limit to magnitude 5 as our cutoff. But you see the same thing. It goes there in the outside region, it shuts off. In the inside region, it actually increases. But now, coming to California, because Debbie came from there, and this is the, she did this, these figures, uh, Northridge. Northridge in California, we had always said California only has low stress drop earthquakes. They could not have anything to do with dilatancy, but Northridge had an st uh, average stress of 27 bars or something, which is quite high, and it shows the same thing. Large events shut off, the smaller ones go through. However, this is El Mayor Cucupa, which is further down next to the Mexican border, which is a low stress drop, two bar event, and it, you see there's absolutely no change except it increases. 
So we regarded this as a sort of confirmation that dilatancy was necessary to do all of that. Well, robust observations require a robust model, uh, wishful thinking, but anyway. So going ahead, uh, what can we do? What we've got in our model is a, we know when, because this is when the big earthquake happens in our model, we can come back a little bit and say at this stage we have high stress and that's when we would see some kind of preparation. So let's analyze the data at this time. Okay, here is the model. These are the pixels, the quanta, whatever you want to call it. Uh, it has 150 by 150 and what we said is let's look at the at that time let's look at the top two percent of stress so you've got this model they've got this matrix with uh, and you've been loading it up and it has a history it's had 10,000 events there choose the two percent highest so here you see there, there's not much high stress here there's a whole little packet of quite high stress and this is the sort of thing you would find in a naturally occurring event because there may have been a, a magnitude here which cleaned <coughs> it out and, and not there and dumps on. Anyway, what we're saying is find these 2% and increase their strength by a small amount, by 10% and see what happens. Because that's what you would get if they were dilating. So we're not saying the whole area is dilating, just little high stress patches are. And bingo, what happens is the blue is the background, our happy uh, B value of about 1. And after stressing it, after strengthening it, it drops. You have the magnitude, it cuts off the large magnitudes, just what we see. So we try different ones. There's 2%. Here you only have a 5% change in strength of that 2%, and it still cuts off the larger magnitudes. Here you've got 5% of the, uh, and stressed 5%, 5% uh, of the peak stress, uh, stressed 5 but it all does the same sort of thing. So it passes, here's another one, only 1% change. What this does, it actually says, yeah, it is robust. If you have something, this number of cells which have to dump onto each other to get the earthquake going, if you have a small increase in strength in some of them, you change the whole pattern. It's, even though it looks very small, the effect look, seem to be very small. Okay, so forecast and prediction. Well, large earthquakes, it's hard to do because you don't know where the earthquake is, so it's a lot of things you can do after the earthquake. You can come back and see many great things. But before the earthquake, it's not quite as easy. So B value, yes. Quiescent region is larger than the fault zone. It's easier to recognize. You can actually recognize a quiescent region. You don't know exactly where the fault is, but you know that is where the earthquake is going to be. But you know you do have a high probability of an earthquake. But all of these are forecasts only. That is, time within years. So, now, dilatancy collapse does give us a chance for prediction. Okay. The Kobe earthquake in Japan uh, actually killed 6,000 people in a city which is actually quite well earthquake-proofed. Uh, this was the first big discouragement for the community, our colleagues in Japan. Uh, but and one advantage of earthquakes in Japan, if you can call anything an advantage with earthquakes, is that the, there's enough money to do a real study on the fault. So what this is, they drilled a hole, I think about two kilometers deep next to the fault in a horizontal <coughs> part going across the fault and took very good core samples all the way so that you could actually get a permeability structure of the material around the fault. So here's the fault 
and for 30 meters on either <coughs> side there's a damage zone which has much higher permeability that means you can get water through much easier now this is critical you see the country rock has permeability of something like 10 to the minus 9 Darcy's which means water if you don't think in those terms water flows it takes years to go through this is 10 to the 4 at least 10 to the 4 times more permeable so it takes minutes to go through that's critical that's key now here comes our model again very simple and uh, we hope it explains everything. Anyway, <laughs> so this is our rock. Pore spaces are filled with water. You have stress buildup over years and years. Uh, you go from here to here where you begin opening up these pore spaces because if you're in the region of low permeability, it takes a long time for the water to refill. <coughs> Eventually, however, of course, water is coming in all the time, water will refill it. Once water refills it and the pore spaces build up, instead of having low pore pressure and essentially dry rock, which gives you maximum strength, you'll build up your pore pressure so that your fault is no longer tightly held together. And of course, in the stress, tectonic stress is increased in this time, it fails. When it fails, and of course, nothing in earthquakes just go bang, it goes pop, 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 for quite a while. Uh, you expel a lot of water. You, when you go from this to this, you've got to get rid of all this water, even though it may be a tenth of a percent of the volume. You've got a lot of water that has to come out very fast. And it's the fate of that water, and the fact that these times are very short, that gives you any chance. <coughs> so let's look at again, see if any of the observations support this idea. Well, we've been in the Kobe earthquake for quite a while, so this will stay there. There's a tunnel that goes through uh, the city, and they measure the amount of water coming through the tunnel. The tunnel, of course, goes through, intersects many aquifers, and uh, here's the accumulated precipitation. You can see it rains like crazy in July or something and then stops. Luckily at the time of the earthquake there was no rain, which keeps it clean. Some interesting things here. It takes a couple of months for the precipitation to get into the aquifer and start pouring out. But you can see that the water flow out of the tunnel more or less mimics the, uh, the precipitation. But at this time here, you suddenly start getting a huge amount of water coming out. So our interpretation is, this is when you begin getting dilatancy breakdown, you've got to get rid of that a lot of water. Now we come to China. This is Hai Cheng. Hai Cheng, uh, this is the seismicity. Again, that's the fault and this is the whole area which is stressed. These are earthquakes, and then these hatched ones are earthquakes, large earthquake faults that have happened in the past. Now, historical earthquakes. The point about Hai Cheng was that this was a successful prediction. And the newspaper report, the Chinese newspaper reports, are sort of interesting. First time in the history of the world an earthquake was successfully predicted. So it was a fairly bold statement. <laughs> but actually, it was actually true at this stage. And we want to look at it to see why it succeeded and also why the next one, Tang Shan, which was more closely monitored and studied, did not. <coughs> OK, this is the area of the fault. Every dot is a water effect report. Now, I should say that at this stage, this prediction was not made by seismologists or experts, uh, mainly by farmers and people like that. 
how did they know what they were doing? Well, they didn't really. But uh, after the 1966 destructive earthquake, either Chairman Mao or, or Cho En Lai, depending on political affiliations, said, you shall predict earthquakes. And that was really an order. Well, these guys said, how do we predict earthquakes? Well, since the Ming times, which is 14th, 15th century, in order to keep the huge area under some kind of government control, uh, the seniors in every village, the elders, were instructed to keep daily records so that the, the magistrate could come touring through and see what was happening, making sure there's no insurrection starting. Well, in some of these villages, of course, nothing happens on a daily basis. So he's got to write something because the magistrate's coming. So he'll write, cow crossed the road, or this did, or somebody did something like that. So they went back to these records and found that, indeed, before earthquakes, if you went back, you found a lot of farmers saying animals behave differently. So that was what they did. Now, here, uh, this is water, all of these happening here. So uh, then when it got closer to the earthquake time, they all, a lot happened, right concentrated on where the earthquake was. <coughs> now, we look at that. This is what you have. OK. Uh, first were snakes and frogs and mice and rats. Uh, but you see what happens here then five days before the earthquake huge increase that's when the so they had warning but five days before the actual earthquake many events happened and so they decided that's the time to evacuate the city which was not easy now when our colleagues at USGS heard about it and went to look at this they found this if they saw the same plots I was given, which was chickens on the roof, unbelievable. And they and when they looked at the damage of the earthquake, they thought you had to have 100,000 people killed, and they said only a few thousand were. So there was general disbelief. Well, after uh, President Nixon opened up China, so-called, in 1982, I went there quite soon afterwards, and I asked to visit somebody in this village, uh, visit one of these villages, and there was a teacher there who could speak English. I said, and of course they were very proud of the achievement, I said, what, what did you use? He said, well, let me show you the chart we used, and it had scribbles on it. It was a chart which was quite impressive, just taking off, and, and you could see the dates, you know, day, a couple of months. So first I, and then I said, well, what's the audience? What's the ordinance? you know, because that was obviously chickens on the roof. So, wow. <laughs> so I said, well, uh, how, what about what happened before? You know, one of the criticisms of Chinese data and Russian data to some extent is they show you this part, but they don't tell you what happened six months before. You don't know what the back, back, background noise is. So I asked, I said, what about before? And the guy looks at me and he says, there's nothing before. Chickens are on the ground, they're not in the roof. <laughs> okay, right. so, so I said, well, why are there chickens on the roof? He says, oh, because the snakes came out. The chickens don't like snakes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I understand, but uh, why did the snakes come out? Oh, because their holes got wet. The water came up and wet their holes and the snakes came out and they chased the chicken. But the observable, that all the farmers had, every farmer has chickens running around. That's what they saw, and that was the high density. They didn't all have wells. So that was the point there, that uh, it's not quite crazy. This is the foreshock of the same earthquake. It's just the last day there were foreshocks. So uh, that was the Hai Ching situation. Now, Tang Shan, which was a little more a year later, uh, was a disaster. This is the one where a quarter of a million people were killed, and I actually visited this city too. Uh, you'll see what the difference is. The pattern is the same, but the time is different. This is a few days, this is a month. They were studying this. Uh, it was uh, Now, I don't know why they were studying it, because all the people 
who at this stage, after Hai Ching, they brought all the big gun scientific people down there. They were all killed, so you can't tell why they thought this was a dangerous area or a dangerous time. Okay, so now coming back to our model, assuming this is truth, okay, uh, what happens here is you bring water in from the outside. Water has mass, so you should see, you could potentially see it in gravity. Water also is quite conductive you could also see it in electrical conductivity. So if we look at Tang Shan, they were doing that. They had gravity studies going from 1971. Here's the earthquake. You can see gravity increases all the time till the earthquake. That's about 80 microgals. If you do a back of the envelope calculation of a tenth of a percent of water in a 20, 20 meter wide slag all around, it gives you more or less this could be done better, but it's it's more or less the right answer. The other thing you can get is the electrical conductivity uh, increases or the resistivity decreases in the same range. So it all fits with that very simple model. And the Chinese have always been interested in a lot of electrical measurements. So both electrical measurements and gravity were quite commonly used. Now we come to Wen Chuan. Okay, which one is the most recent one? Uh, why we got this one was not predicted. Uh, so I think 84, 86,000 people were killed there. But 80 people went running out of the village shouting, "Get out of here! Get out of your village! Something is happening!" So something did. They, of course, were okay and. Here is some data. Uh, electrical conductivity also increased, resistivity decreased a couple of months before. And you can see the acceleration of events, just like the other one. But this is a plot. Fu Kong did what was very helpful. You see, in China, this obviously was a failure. And anybody running out was discounted because they had set up bureau uh, places where you would go and you'd sign that you saw a something. Well, people didn't do that much, so there was no prediction, official prediction. But what Fu Kong did, she sent questionnaires to everybody all over the place saying, did you do anything? Well, it's not really a prediction, but it gives you a very good idea of what's going on. First of all, you can see what I've been talking about over and over again. They stressed areas much bigger than the fault area. All of the purple dots are the have seen something. It's a site with the water anomaly. This is the earthquake itself. But what's critical here and, and sobering is all the dots which don't have any water event. This is just an indication of what's so difficult about this process. It's the earth, it's messy. Uh, you see here, and you can see, if you had four or five instruments here, which were wonderful, just the right instruments, you analyzing water, whatever, you may see nothing. Or you may, at the best, get something which has had a lot of scatter. So this, just being on the surface, getting from the aquifer, getting from where the water is to the <coughs> surface depends on faults, on cracks, on many things. And in fact, of course, uh, we've all just had a uh, talk on hydrofracking. This is the Barnard Shale, and you can see all the hydrofrac points, an amazing number of holes, actually. Uh, they're not all productive. There are a few that are productive, and those are the ones which have a deeper contact. So. Where are we so far? Uh, we've got about two weeks or less. We need to monitor the aquifer. Uh, we've talked about, as far as we're, our work is concerned, Alan and mine is, 
the aquifer is an enemy. You try to keep away from it. You don't want to, that's a noise. But here we say the aquifer may be the signal. So a vertical component strain meter may be what you need. And we are hoping that our colleague Kyoshi Suihiro will install one in the region which has a long-term prediction in Japan. But this is a very major point here is a bureaucracy approach change because that's really critical. First of all, the concept that you've got to make a decision quickly is something, and also what kind of instruments should you be supporting. Now, this is the worst time because the politicians, the bureaucrats, certainly in Japan and China, I don't know, China had a huge amount of money, it still has, but Japan, are, they feeling discouraged. They have spent huge amounts on earthquake prediction. All they've got are failures. And the question is, uh, why should we support you more? So we rely on Kyoshi Suihiro, our colleague, who uh, was senior enough that he can go and talk to the people at the top and try to persuade them. Also, in order to change the idea of studying earthquakes, to get more of the kind I'm talking about, rather than seismic uh, focal mechanism, and things like that that people are concentrating on, he's got it go to the professor, professorial level, the head of department level, to try to change this, the, in the direction of studies, and he's doing that. And both of these have had some effect. Uh, the Japanese are now are monitoring water wherever they can and doing things like that, but uh, it's a tough time. It's a tough time, really, to do this, and the, our colleagues are moderately depressed. Well, let's go ahead with say, what else? You know, you get sort of drunk with some small success, and you think, well, let's see what else we can do. So, tidal triggering. This is something that, you know, the earth tides put a stress on a fault every day. If stress is building up linearly, you should have earthquakes triggered by, or somewhat triggered by tidal stress, because it goes up and goes down. Uh, Paul Rydlick and I did a study in the Campi Flegrei region a long time ago and found there wasn't any. And we've never quite understood why. Uh, and slow earthquakes. Slow earthquakes <coughs> has been something we worked on for a long time here. And I think we can finally understand it. Well, we've got an idea anyway. Let's see. So we've got our handy dandy uh, model of the way the Earth is supposed to work. We've got our cells. We've got a dilatancy. And the point is that this is quite a steep curve. A small change in stress is quite a large change in volume. So let's see what happens with tidal amplitude. OK, here's tectonic stress building up. If this is a failure level, you'd expect, and it, it breaks there, you'd expect that a couple of days before it, or sometime before it, this is a tidal amplitude, will push you up over the failure rate. But it doesn't. So we're saying, well, what happens is, if you have, in the normal sense, you have no dilatancy. If you increase the stress with the tidal amplitude, you have slight dilatancy, that strengthens it. Your failure rate goes up. So the very fact that you you are stressing a, mo a, a medium which is already stressed but has no dilatancy will get it to fail. On the other hand, if you already had dilatancy, uh, you should trigger it. And this is indeed what happened on the Tohoku earthquake. Well, a hundred means it's absolute, absolutely random. Uh, Zero means it's quite triggered. A tenth is it's, it's certainly triggered. But you see what happened here. There was absolutely no triggering until sometime around here when you began getting triggering. And after the earthquake, there was no triggering again. Now, the problem with this study is that uh, you have the population is very small because you're so far away. But Takanami is working on an area in Japan where we have very good data and have an inside-outside area and 
it's a matter of getting a whole lot of old data going back to 1978, but he's doing pretty well, and hopefully in some months we will have a much better idea of what happens, a more detailed idea, and there may be, it may help us actually in seeing what happens. Okay, so that's this. Now, slow earthquakes. What we found was slow earthquakes happen on the same fault as ordinary earthquakes. This is one of the puzzling things. And the one we found on Izu, a couple of years earlier, there was just a regular earthquake on it. And this, I think, is a very important observation because it says the fault can fail in different ways. So this is the region where you have an earthquake that's already there. And so what we do is this. We have the same for in order for the earthquake fault to grow, this has to dump this, this one fails, it dumps stress on there, which dumps stress on there. It's just our standard model. But if you have no, ex no extra dilatancy, you pop up there and it won't fail because your dilatancy has made it stronger. However, in that permeable region, water comes in rather quickly, in minutes or seconds. So then it fails. So Instead of this being a permanent state, it comes there, water comes in, and it fails. And I think that's how you can get slow earthquakes. Now, slow earthquakes should be quite patchy, and we're trying to get that data. Now, it's a matter of, again, getting back old data where you have enough seismicity around, and enough uh, seismicity around to see how, what this is doing. But anyway, uh, our feeling was we can understand many things, many observations, which we didn't at all before. And so that gives us a feeling that there may be some reality in the model. I mean, we actually may not sound it, but we are fairly humble, and we realize this could actually all be wrong. But the fact that it fits so many observations which have not been fit before makes us feel that maybe there's something in it. And so, uh, Kyoshi is pushing fairly hard in Japan, giving many talks and visiting many institutions to see if one can get some students or some departments working more on this problem and expanding some of these studies. And maybe putting in, he's trying to get money to put, uh, have a hole in so we can put a vertical in. Now, one instrument's not going to do anything, but at least it'll give us some experience. So that is the, uh, I think I've shown you, tried to show you that there is light at the end of the tunnel, but it's fairly difficult because you have to have a bureaucratic change. You have to make that decision. You have to, somebody has to make a decision. Now I will say that when we started on this in, in California, we found the uh, California group, whatever they were called, hazard mitigation or civil defense or something, they were very sensitive to having some test runs to try to do this. They wanted to be ready to be able to do something if there was a prediction. So they've been encouraging their community to, okay, predict something, you know, let us try even if it doesn't work. Well, uh, we haven't quite succeeded in that. But anyway, they have the right approach. Now, in Japan, Early on in the early 70s, there was already a parliamentary guide put out of what you do in this an earthquake prediction, what you have to do. You have to slow down trains, you have to do this, you have to provide water. And also, you can, without any penalty, cancel the prediction. That's very important. Now, uh, prediction has another serious political implication as well. And that is that, for instance, a lot of people don't want a prediction. I mean, they really think, yes, we would nice to predict an earthquake, but boy, if there's a small chance it isn't going to happen, we don't want it. So we had one successful prediction with a substrain meters which were in the Yunnan area. I got a very excited email from somebody saying, wow, we predicted this earthquake, we've already got new trucks and financial rewards and 
all good. I said, oh, that's wonderful. Can you, I'd like to see if you don't mind sending me some copies of records to see what you based your prediction on. After a bit of silence, it's terrible. What happened is, when they predicted this, the mayor and all the senior people, including the seismologists, people running it, left town, went on vacation. The earthquake happened, and they came back. Well, so internally they were all very happy. But then word started getting out to the populace. Uh, we have let our comrades down, and this is a bad thing. So the response was, nothing happened. We never had a prediction. Expunge everything. It's all gone. And that's the situation. So uh, it, it's a, there's a difficulty with this. And uh, in Mammoth Lakes, where we did some work, OK, there's a beautiful road coming in. But there were a couple of magnitude six earthquakes there. There's a volcano that may go off. Uh, people were pretty nervous. So this one road coming in, that's, that's asking for trouble. So they put in another road, which is a straight escape road, but it's called Scenic Drive. And you go on it and you say, there's nothing scenic. Well, it's not a scenic drive. It's, a, it's another road so you can get out if there's a problem. But you see what the other difficulties are. Anyway. That's a picture of where we are. Uh, I think it's not hopeless. I think it's actually quite hopeful, but it's not easy, and one has to extend beyond the scientific community. Thanks very much. OK, I have some questions for Selwyn. Please, check. So yeah. uh, do you have any feel for false alarm rate for things like quiescence and B value? Oh, well, you know, okay, for, let's do B value. You see, the problem with B value is that if you haven't had the earthquake, you've just got a patch of B value somewhere. Uh, I don't know how that is because we tend to focus on, okay, there's B value. A lot of this you go to afterwards. You see, so I can't answer that. As far as quiescence is concerned, uh, I don't know. I think generally you get some earthquake, but whether it's the one you want or not, I don't know. So usually there's been something else which triggered you to look at that event. Yeah, these are these are four. The, I regard these as warnings. You know, maybe we should bother about it or do more studies. The what? Your cartoon model. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that one. So, um, when you're at uh, step two there, you presumably can get some estimate of how fast the pore space is opening up from the stream that you, you can measure. And you can use um, ground measurements to estimate how fast you're filling up the pores. Oh, ground measurements are, you know, this is fractions of a tenth of a percent, so you see almost nothing on the ground. No, but you, you can measure the permeability, and so you can estimate how fast you should be filling up those pores. Well, you can do it on gravity or electrical conductivity. Don't forget, all of this is happening five or six kilometers down. So, so what, what I'm saying is, can you use those measurements to estimate roughly the kind of time scale on which you reach? Uh, the transition from stage three to four. Uh, the best data we have is the gravity and conductivity from uh, Tangshan or Wenchuan. Uh, I would say no. You see, you don't once you once the earthquake hasn't happened, you don't really know how big a fault you've got. So if you had a small fault and you get that amount of gravity, you may say, well, that may be ready to pop, but the value may not be very high because it's not a very large fault. So I think you've got, before the fault happens, it's very hard, and because you don't know how big that earthquake is going to be, it's quite hard to have a good estimate. That's why we like the crude way of water splashing out.
Yeah. When your model explains the, uh, the radon anomaly that sometimes... Well, water is coming up. So to the extent that you are diluting or pulling up water, it could do. I would say it's consistent with it. I wouldn't go further than that. Well, they, a lot of these faults have had radon anomalies, yeah. See, the point is, you've got a very large area, much larger than your fault area, and there are lots of little places that are dilatant which pop off and give you water coming out all over the place. Yeah. Oh, vertical strain can be very sensitive. You can measure strains of 10 to minus 11 or 10 to minus 10 relatively easily. And that's a rather small change in pressure in an aquifer. So we have got one instrument, always been in Montserrat, in an aquifer, which is a major pain and it almost makes it useless for us. But there is somebody who likes, who thinks aquifers are important and they are studying it. So if the cell and are given the difficulty of uh, installing strain meters at the expense of uh, boreholes and so on, on the other <coughs> hand, if they're this macroscopic signal due to snakes fleeing uh, filled holes, yep. uh, people all over China presumably have uh, wells drilled to get their water up, right? And the, yeah. the, the wells are filling up and down as it rains and as they draw water yeah, from yeah, it, but yeah. you could average over the signals and see if there really is a monotonic increase due to this, this effect. I mean, with consumer electronics in, in China, they could build a million of these things for a million yeah. dollars and yeah. instrument uh, them and do yeah. some averaging and see if their region really is a rather cheaply. Yeah, well, so okay. We had one, about that, I mean, yeah, one special. instrument we have um, our phone. Uh, we drilled a hole, put in an instrument, and people there saw, wow, there's an aquifer down there. And just a couple of tens of yards down, they drilled their own hole, and they put a pump on, pumping it, and we suddenly found the instrument has this huge amount of noise. <laughs> so any time you have, this is the problem, you've got to have a primitive village. Any time you have a borehole, you have a pump on it, and you've got a huge noise. Now in Japan, of course, you have almost no hope at all. Japan is full of electrical noise and pumping and doing things like that. So it, it's a big problem. Chinese in the, in the rural area, yeah, that's great. But, you know, China's rapidly moving away from that. We, and so that's a problem. But I know the one area, you see, they have <coughs> co-ops there. What happened on this hole? Okay. Nobody has, a, no single person has enough money to drill a hole and the banks won't lend them. But a whole group, you know, 10 farmers around there will group together, put this hole in, and now they will go next to your instrument because they know that's where they, they know there's water. And then they have to pump and distribute it all. So it made that instrument almost useless. So, a couple of historical questions. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned that the inside-outside sort of course is Yes, yes. Years ago. Don't you miss that? Yes. 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 Right. Yes. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Forecasting slash predicting. Right. Right. And that's died away. So what's the difference? There isn't a difference. The point is that Mogi, when he was doing it, he did not have small earthquakes. So he could only see big ones. He was in the cutoff. He was magnitude fours or fives. So. In our model, he was always in the quiet zone. However, later on, so you see what I mean? Uh, let's, uh, I should spell it, uh, let's get one. Um, no, no. Mm. He was always here. He, there were no small earthquakes. He was always in the large earthquakes. So that looked promising. Then what happened is people developed seismometers which didn't, could go much smaller. When they started looking, that hole disappeared. The donut disappeared. 
So that's the problem with the advance, and yeah, it was exactly the same thing. And the other, the other historical question, of course, is Blue Mountain Lake. Ah, yeah, yeah. This was uh, Lamont Blue. Yes. Uh, very confident. In fact, they were making predictions and Absolutely. And back and things yep. they came through and yep. they claimed, yep. probably, honestly, one yes. of success. Yeah. And there were subsequent, this is all based on the BPBS ratio, That's which correct. changes yep, the yep. result of Absolutely. the latency. Yep. Absolutely. And then there were subsequent tests of that, and again, that yep. went nowhere. So, yep. again, what's the problem? Well, I don't know. Blue Mountain Lake for magnitude falls and four and a half. And I know the Japanese attitude was they weren't interested, didn't make any difference whether you did fours and fours and a half. They were only interested in sixes and above. Uh, why Blue Mountain, Blue Mountain Lake, you know, got the guy into front cover of Time magazine. So it was sold as the problem is solved. In fact, Agarwal, I think, said, we're at 100 percent, but we're going to get better. <laughs> so there was a lot of confidence, and I think that led to a little backlash. But then I think Kanamori was one of the people who did this. He looked across somewhere in Japan, I can't remember, looking at VPVS, waiting for an earthquake to happen, uh, with a, a good source and distribution of stations. And when the earthquake happened, the, he did not have seen, he didn't see anything in VPVS. So he, after that, he and he being pretty influential, said, you don't have anything. And I know Frank Press was always critical of him being too extreme. Sure. Yeah. Well, I believe Chris Schultz, who was a yeah. good scientist. He was a very good scientist, absolutely. said subsequently, as I recollect, there were also tests on California to achieve the same result. Yeah, right, right. Uh, but Schultz has always maintained that the it was dismissed on the basis of inadequate testing. He may be well or mean right. You know from the people we deal with around here that there are a lot of very strong opinions. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was just wondering, I, I, if I'm right now, um, the world is, is very much uh, adopting smartphone technology. Yeah. yeah. Particularly in places like China where they're, they're so not even going to electrify. Yeah. And one thing that struck me was when we had our earthquake here, is I, I, I felt the P wave. I had no idea what I was feeling. And I sat there thinking, this is really odd. And then the S wave came, and I knew what I was feeling. Right. right. But P wave is eminently detectable. And it was really, oh, a, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I'm not a psychologist, so I was really impressed with it. Had I known that was a P wave, yeah. I could have gotten out of the building for the S wave ahead. Yeah, right. And yeah. that would save a huge <coughs> number of lives yeah. if people are willing to respond to that. OK. So. We have an academy uh, committee which I would chair, actually, a real-time warning. And the point was to use this fact that radio communication is much faster than seismic waves, so that if you detect something, you can actually get things shut down. And <coughs> some companies, like chemical companies, took that very seriously and had remote control on their valves with, so you could do that. Now, <coughs> the Japanese have been doing that with their bullet trains almost right from the beginning. Seismometers somewhere can shut down parts of a track without any human intervention. So if it, you have a certain amount of vibration here, they will shut down the power to track on the other side of it. And they've never had a major accident, even though they've had some big earthquakes which actually caused a minor derailment, but not a disaster. So, yeah, that sort of thing has been, it's a, a good idea and it has been done in some places, yeah. People will do things like that if you don't publicize it. <coughs> you know, that seems to be the big, one of the big problems. So, Selwyn's been here at DTM for 52 years. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, with that baseline, I hesitate to make a prediction, but I will forecast you will be here for quite a bit longer. So, if you have some questions for him, please feel free to stop by Selwyn's office and, and ask him. Let's thank Selwyn again. Thank you.